Good afternoon, everyone. Um, people are still coming in. Um, my name is um, Libby Wilhelmson, and I am program director at Bianc, the Burn Injury Association, in North Carolina. And I want to welcome you, welcome you to our webinar series. We hold a new webinar every other month on the third. Wednesday from 1 to 2.15. You can always um, join um, or register for it on our website. Um, also, hopefully you are getting um, the, our newsletter or you can go on our website and sign up for that where we advertise them also. Um, it, during this webinar, the chat is disabled, but the Q&A is not. So please put your questions in the Q&A. And at the end of the presentation, um, Cindy will be answering your questions. Um, also, um, you will receive a certificate after this um, webinar um, showing your attendance after you complete our survey. So please do the survey at the end and um, then we will be able to send you your certificate. We are recording this and it will be uploaded to Bianc's YouTube channel um, by early December. Um, I think that's all of my bookkeeping and now we're so excited to introduce Cindy Daniel. She is the executive director of the National Concussion Management Center and we are thrilled to have her here to talk about brain injury as a chronic condition. How? What do we do now? So let me turn it over to Cindy. Thank you. Cindy, are you able to hear the audio right now? Yes, yes. I was just waiting for the Wait slides. For the slides. Yeah. All right, there we go. <laughs> That's okay, right, good. I did okay. see it. In, I just I saw something in the chat, so I wanted to make sure. Um, okay. Hey guys, it's Cindy Daniel, National Disability and National Concussion Management Center. So glad to be here. Um, like I said, I'm not techno savvy, and so um, so forgive me if I keep going back and forth and, and looking at things, but looking at my notes. But very glad that you joined with us today. Um, this is about brain injury and current conditions and what that looks like and what do we need to do now. And so on that note, um, again, um, I'm gonna share. And so if I look down a little bit, it's just sharing my notes and sharing my information a little bit on that. So we're gonna go, um, are we starting the slides? Thank you. Brain injury as a chronic condition. So the first one was, I'm just going to show some definitions. So the first definition was traumatic brain injury definition. And what that is, is just a traumatic brain injury. It's a brain injury that is caused by an outside force. He died that is caused by a forceful bump, blow, or blow to the head, or body, or from an object entering the brain. So again, most of y'all know the, the, the definitions of all of these, but I'm just kind of going through to see how this all emerges together and how this all kind of blends in. So again, the first type was to my brain injury definition. This one is a chronic condition definition. And again, a chronic condition, I can say, a chronic condition, also known as chronic disease or chronic illness, is a health condition or disease that is persistent or otherwise long lasting in its effect or in its disease that comes with time. So again, you have the deep a TBI definition and you have the chronic condition definition for and having difficulty. So next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So this is as TBI as a chronic condition. So this is like when TBI and a chronic condition have a baby. They kind of like merge in together. And you see that it's a long-term effect as a brain injury. And a lot of these effects are, of course, fatigue, sensitive to noise and light, memory loss, mobility problems, chronic migraines, trouble with focus and executive functioning, depression, anxiety, susceptibility to percussion, or such as Alzheimer's disease, strokes, or other brain 
traumas or diseases. But the two, this is two kind of merge together. And this is kind of, of some of the symptoms, what you will see in, in these. So next slide, please. So now let's look at the gaps. So look at the gaps of care. So the first one, we're gonna go through each one, Congress to support people with brain injury. Okay, you're gonna hear this, I'm gonna say this word many, many, many times. There's a few words I'm gonna say many times through this presentation. Education, education and advocacy. Those are almost the two key words that you need to educate someone to understand. And Congress is a big tool to educate Congress. You need to share your story. You need to talk to them. You need to let them know what brain injury is all about. And also that it is a chronic condition. I mean, get involved. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to go on a hill. You don't have to go federally. You could go to your town hall meetings. You can go locally. You know, you could talk to city mayors. You, know, you could talk to people that are in your area, you know, that are making change in your in your area. You don't have to go big. You can. I mean, I know in March, we have Brain Injury Awareness Month. And I know the INC is there all the time. I'm always hanging with them when they're in D.C. And we go and we talk to our representatives, our Senate, our congressmen. Um, we always talk to them up there to let them know how important and how to support brain injury. So again, Congress makes a big, I mean, a lot of policies, a lot of laws. You have the TBI Reauthorization Act. You have um, the Rehab Act. You have the Americans with Disability Act. You have also the bill that I'm working on, H.R. 3083, Concussion Plant Brain Injury Clearinghouse Bill. I mean, there's a lot of bills out there that we need to support and talk about and get our Congress to know, hey, this is a thing and our voices need to be heard. So education is a key. Second thing, have people in place to support people with brain injury. And I have to, before I say anything, I wanna say, again, to have these organizations and have people in place, like the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid, which is gonna be, um, well, in, be the next slide after this, after I finish with this, I'll be further talking about more of the centers of Medicare and Medicaid. But have, again, people in place, organizations in place, talk about, educate people about brain injury. And we lost a big, big advocate on one of these people in place. And Congressman Bill Pascrell, um, a congressman that started the TBI caucus up in DC and passed away last year previously, passed away. And kudos to him. I mean, rest in peace, Congressman Pascrell, you, you did a, a great job and you led us. Now it's time for us to educate and do your job too. So that's a big example. You have Congressman Bacon up there as well. That's the other co-chair that is doing a good job supporting brain injury. But again, it's all about educating and making sure these people that are in place truly, truly support their community, supporting the people with depression, TBI, other acquired brain injury, supporting that. And we have those, those individuals in place. So know who they are, educate them and work on that end. Funding, oh my gosh, money. That's always, that's always a big gap. You know, it's, you need dollars to make these things happen. But again, it takes Congress, our local government officials and individuals to understand how important this is and how this funding should go so we can do our work and then we can get and get the, the services we need, the support we need to get all the things we need. Funding is a crucial, but again, it goes back to educating the right people on how much funding we need and how crucial it is. And resources, naming a few resources. I mean, resources are a key. I can go on on that and be almost a whole hour, but your resource, the group right now, BINC, big advocates for this. The IAA, the national group, United States Brain Injury Alliance, National American Brain Injury Society, NAVIS, National Concussion Management Center. Woo -hoo. I don't want my team to fire me, so I've got to, sh got to share my, give us a plug. Also, besides brain injury organizations, there are still other disability organizations that can provide funding, equipment, um, treatment, transportation, caregivers. There's a lot of other disability groups that sometimes people don't know that you can 
tap into, like the National Centers of Independent Living, Nichols, there's always one in counties in every state, and also NOB, National Organization on Disability. Those are two key things, but just know that besides the brain tree organizations, they're fantastic and can do so much, and always they always have your back, always have your back. There are other disability groups or organizations out there that can help and support you as well. So I don't, I want to give that out too. And then your strength and weaknesses and TBI care management. That kind of goes with all of this. We almost need to educate Congress to support, to find these resources to and have these people in place to get the strength of care, of care management in, in TBI. That we need to treat, they, we need to see the person as a as a person. And that the brain, I mean, controls everything. It, it controls everything. So we need to have it supported. And so we need to have these groups treat the whole person, not just the symptoms, but mental, emotional, physical, and social. As anyone, as my colleagues would know, I mean, my other colleagues who have brain injury and concussions and who have their disabilities, brain injury because I am a person with a TBI. And so I'm talking to my colleagues that we all know it's it's the whole person, but mainly see the person as a person. And I always will say this, look through the eyes, to the soul of that person, because that soul is who that person is. Not the brain injury, not the disability, but that heart and soul is who that person is. And so we have to recognize it, we have to support it, and we have to make sure these gaps fill up. And how we do that is educate, use our voice, and make sure that all these things are in place. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Okay, I, I mentioned the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm gonna say kudos to our BIA folks. Hello, family there. Due to their advocacy of Brain Injury Association of America, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has recognized traumatic brain injury as a chronic health condition. I'll say that again. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has recognized traumatic brain injury as a chronic health condition. TBI has been added to CMS list of chronic conditions for chronic special need plans through its Medicare Advantage program. And this will start in January 2025 plan. So know that January 1st, don't expect, poof, magic will happen. We all wish that, but again, it's government. And we all know government does not work very, very fast. We pray and they do work, but it takes our advocacy and that's to, to tell them and to work with them and say, hey, you know, we know you're, you've got this new plan, where is it? And they mentioned January of 20. 2025 plan. And so we say that, but what does this mean? What does this look like? And you're asking, Cindy Lou, what does this mean? Next slide, please. This is what this means. So it will provide several advantages for people with brain injury, the allocation of additional public health resources to focus on lifelong effects of brain injury, as well as health insurance plans, Medicare and Medicaid, I want to, but other insurances as well, provide additional benefits and other supports as they do for other chronic health conditions. And the greatest benefit would be an increase to public awareness of long-term effects on brain injury that affects the est estimate 5 million Americans with brain injury related disability. So that is what it means. If we go further, we're looking again, January, 2025, Wait for, I mean, there's going to be a lot more on this coming on this. BIA is on top of this. Um, and I know, that again, state BINC will be a part of this. I mean, they will get always be fed out and get fed information, what that means, what that means on our state. And so hang on, stay tuned, and um, more things will be coming on this subject matter. But kudos, BIA. Thank you, guys. So, ne okay, so next slide, please. Okay, advocacy. I mentioned again your voice, 
need for advocacy. So future advocacy. There will always be change because we will always have a change in administration and representation. So guys, I, I don't I think I don't need to tell you what's happening. We're gonna get a new president. That means new cabinet. That means new administration. I mean, it's getting ready to happen in January. But the others are going out, the other ones come in and they bring their own cabinet, they bring their own people. That is a key to have our voices be heard, to have advocacy. What does this mean? We will not know, probably until January. We care a little tidbits, but change is going to happen. There will always be a need for better policy, and the process of advocacy is how we help these lawmakers implement them. So again, this is a key. Our voices, we matter. We are a citizen. We are part of this community. We voted them in. We can vote them out, and this showed this past November the people were heard. And so, I'm not not talking politics on this one. This that will take almost two or three days to do a conversation on that one. But what this means is that our voices we have to advocate, like it or not, we will have to have our voices be heard and be strong and stand together. What I love about this picture, you see all these hands together. That is what it's going to take, guys, to make it happen. Uh, we're a village, and we're stronger together than we are apart. And so we need to stay strong to our mission statements, to our advocacy, to our voice, and know that people with brain injury matter, and that our voices matter, and that we stick together, and we need to be heard, and we need to be supported, and all those gaps of care need to be answered. Amen and amen to that. So next slide, please. So how do I make my voice heard? Here are some ideas and some thoughts about this. So again, this goes with, you could do this locally, county, state, federal. This is truly have how to advocate. I mean, and advocacy is never going away. We advocate for everything. I mean, you go to the grocery stage, grocery store, and you ad maybe advocate for certain prices or how to get things. I mean, advocate. we advocate on so many different things. Um, again, it's how our voices, that, are, that, are, that we matter, and our voices matter. And so that doesn't matter if you're doing it in a town hall meeting, if you're doing it in a state meeting, if you're doing, if you go in D.C., you go to your representatives there, it does not matter where you go or what you do. Your voices need to be heard. And here are some tips on how to make that happen. Know who your representatives are and their contacts. So that's the key thing. And I'll throw out an example as well. If you're going to go see your representative anywhere, like, like I said, in your city or county or Federally, if you go up to D.C. And, or even in, in Raleigh or in your state or whatever, um, don't be upset if you don't see or sit down and talk with the representative themselves. A lot of times you will talk to the health care um, staffer a lot of times. And to tell you the truth, I've been doing this for years, 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 and, um, and decades. And so um, I always appreciate I mean I'd rather talk to the staffer because I know they have the ear of that representative and the staffers know what's going on. So feel okay if you talk to a staffer because again I prefer talking to the staffer more sometimes than the representative. If you get a representative, wow, but don't be upset if you get a staffer because they know just as much and again they have their the ears of that representative. Do the research before you go there, again, time is limited. So know exactly. And a lot of times, just make sure you know what you're going to go for, what you're asking for, and to make sure. And if you have it written down, like I have notes about this, my presentation and this, you know, have things written down. They don't mind you having it written down. How would you're going to say? A lot of times, maybe keep it to um, one topic so it doesn't get so clouded. But just know, do your research and make an appointment. Again, these guys are busy. Usually they allow 15 minutes. Sometimes you get 30. Boo-poo's on that one, guys. 
Um, but make an appointment because then at least you know you have their ears for 15 minutes. And again, when you have that one talk and ready to go, that 15 minutes will go fast, but you'll get their ear and get it in. So again, make that appointment. And again, going to say what I've just been saying, 15 minutes is usually that limited time. So make it short, make it sweet, make it powerful. If it's just a sentence, make it powerful, make that statement. Make it short but specific, I just said that. Issue, resolution, and cost. Again, funding, folks, funding. That's always the cost of everything. Have time for questions. So again, at the end, they might have questions. You might have something to say. But again, have a little bit of limited that time. So you might want to make a 10-minute presentation and five minutes to ask them if they have questions. Leave handouts on what you are asking along with your contact information. Always leave them something. Leave them some paperwork. Because again, a lot of times the representative will say, well, um, what is the issue? And a lot of times they'll have hands, well, this is what they brought in. This is what they're coming in with. So have that ready to go. Have that, have that um, information ready to go. And then then thank you emails. They love to say thank being being thanked for their time. So always have know that the thank you emails after your meeting and show appreciation for their time. So always know to always send those little thank you emails. I always do that right after right after if I can get on my computer on that, always send a little thank you on there. So that's really important. And do follow calls in a couple of weeks to see if they have any questions or thoughts. You know, just to see, just to say and to know that, hey, I saw you a couple of weeks ago. Just want to see if um you have any thoughts, if you have any if you have any questions yet or, or thought about something. You know, always have that. And last one, keep in their face. Not literally, you know, you don't have to right in their face, but keep, let them know, let them know their names. I mean, I walk those halls in DC all the time. I do my little steps all the time and, and you get to know people. And so let them know when they start seeing you and that, and they recognize that name, your points mean something. So let them know if you call in a week or two weeks or whatever, but keep in their face because that lets them know this is a really important issue for this person. This is really important. So let them know that. Again, your voice matters. Your voice matters. So let it be heard and don't be apologetic or embarrassed by doing that. Let your voice be heard. So let me make sure I got that. So the 10, I mean, okay, I got that. Next slide, please. Okay, this is my reminder slide. And so, you know, I mentioned before that, um, I didn't share my story a lot, and I just introduced myself because I'm the executive director of the National Concussion Management Center. But I also mentioned, and I don't know if I mentioned that, I didn't mention that I have a TBI, but also I am a walking paraplegic. So I have, I'm a TBI, I have comorbidities. I'm kind of a perfect storm. I have multiple disabilities. And I take this reminder slide with me everywhere because it reminds me of who I am. My injury happened, oh, I'm gonna age myself, but thank God I'm in a little square so you might not be able to see my wrinkle. But um, my, my, happened, my first injury, my walking paraplegia happened before the ADA. And there wasn't curb cuts. There wasn't um, ramps or automatic doors. There wasn't anything, there wasn't the ADA. And so there wasn't any law, you know, um, there was two things, you know, you go to an institute, if you had a disability, you go to an institution, or you fight like hell to show someone that you matter, that you belong. And I, and again, I was dropped from a cheerleading pyramid, and the doctor put me wrong in the cast, and I sustained a, a, a spinal cord injury. And so, the, while the doctor put me wrong in the cast, it finished the, I wasn't able to walk, and it paralyzed me. And this again was before the ADA. And um, I remember the doctor said, just institutionalize her because she won't be worth anything. And she said, she's handicapped. And again, folks, we don't use the word handicap anymore. The terminology for handicap is a, a beggar, you know, a hand in cap. That's what they use in is old English term where when people use the word handicap is that they see a beggar on the side, and he's a hand in cap, handicap. That's where handicap came from, that people with disabilities were beggars. Guys, 
my colleagues who have disabilities, we are not beggars. We are citizens, we are employed, we work, we pay, we do taxes, we are a part of the society. And I want you all to remember that, my colleagues, that we are SOMA. And so, again, this was before the law. And so they wanted, they, I had to go, my family had to fight in court to make sure I wasn't institutionalized. And they said, she won't be working. She's nothing. She's nothing. She's handicapped. She just put her away and work on your other two children. She doesn't have a voice. She won't be anything. She won't be anything. Just get rid of her, put her away, and just take care of your other two children. And my mom, my mom said, no, she is someone. You just watch her and make it happen. And through all my years, and through all my treatments, at this time, they did electrical shocks. I lost all my hair. You can't say I have sport, spiky hair now and wear it short anymore. Because if I get it long, it starts falling out because it can't handle the, the stress of my body. But with that, um, growing up, it took me about two years to learn to walk. And I had family. I had a physical therapist that believed in me. And we did surgeries and believed in me. And and I told them, say, I'm, going, I'm focusing because I'm going to be someone someday. I, and they kept saying, Cindy, you are someone. I want you all to remember you are someone. And so with that, I learned to walk. I have no feeling from the waist down. But with that, I started to make some change. I started to work on things. And um, 1990, when the ADA came, um, I worked was working as in the Forest Service in North Carolina, uh, Pisgah National Forest. And I was working there as a special emphasis of people with disabilities. And they thought they were getting, oh, here, we have someone with a disability who's doing the disability work. Little did they know, Cindy Lou was loose, and I was going to make that force accessible. And accessible, I made it happen. When 1990, when ADA came on, girlfriend made it happen. And I invited, at that time, Bush Sr. and Clinton was just doing the change of command. And with that, he came out to see the force made accessible. And they looked and they left. And I received a letter a week later inviting me to be on the President's Committee on Employment for People with Disability. And that's when my career and my voice started to be heard. Because at that time, I made all the forced areas because I had the President's support. All the forced areas had accessibility areas in their forced, in all the forced areas. Um, we worked on curb cuts. We worked on, if you see the little hand, when you see the lights and it gives you an account, we worked on that to make sure people who are blind, people who are deaf were able to see the light, be able to hear things and be able to go through the curb cuts. There's a lot of signage, automatic doors. The, I, can, I can add on all the things, look around. And we were able to make change for all, all citizens with disability, including brain injury. Because back in the day, they put brain injury into learning disability. They, they, put, and they put that into mental illness. So we, so we, as a committee, we broke it down and also changed it to brain injury. And also changed it to give it its own disability and not put it under mental illness because different disabilities, it's different acts. And so on that note, that started my voice, my voice to be heard. And I worked very hard in the federal government. I've been in the Department of Labor, I've been in the um, Department of Interior, I've been in the Department of Agriculture, I was in the Department of Homeland Security with FEMA where I also ended up in. I worked with a lot of states and I have my nonprofits and also. And so with that, um, I remember again, going back, one of the things that I fought so hard in, in schools. Because again, at college, this is where that all happened, is where I was going to school, and this was again before the ABA. And this and this slide reminds me of my mother. So this is where I'm coming with this, is that she was always my advocate. And with that, I had braces up my waist, and this before the law and ABA, and I was going up to school. And again, things weren't simple. This was before ABA when I had my injury. And things were accessible. And people would laugh. People would count and and kind of um kind of bet if I would make it up the ten steps, um to see if I would fall or to see if I quit. 
And it took me an hour to get up those steps and get into class. And then once I've gone to class, um, my professors will look at my homework and rip it up and put it in the trash can and say, you do not belong. You are a handicap. You do not have a life. You do not have an education here. We only take care of people that are going to go somewhere. And they made me leave the classroom. And I did the first time, and I remember drying in tears back to because I couldn't, couldn't drive. And my mom always took me to class because I had these electronic shock treatments every day. And I remember my mom always said, Cindy Lou, don't listen to that noise. Don't listen to that noise. Don't look to the side, don't look to the left, don't look to the right, don't look behind you. You look forward and you look at your destination, where you are going. You look at that destination. Don't listen to the noise because it doesn't matter. You matter. You matter. And you're going to make a change and you'll make things happen. So my whole life, guys, is what I'm trying to say. I grew up with all this. And then 2008, I mean, I was making things change on the President's Committee, making all these policy laws, sharing the ADA day. And 2008, working with FEMA, was in a car accident and sustained a traumatic brain injury. And so, again, going back to the same thing, I have permanent vertigo. I have other things going on. Um, not the best with technology. So I thank my ladies, Alyssa, and I thank um, Libby for helping take care and have my back on this. I appreciate the INC as well, allowing me to share my story and share these slides. And that because I always say, there's nothing about us without us. And hear these voices because we matter. And so on that note, I thought and thought, and again, I went back to the doctors with the DBI, not the orthopedic dogs, but here again, working with um, other type of doctors, and we're like, well, you have, again, you have a brain injury, so um, you won't be able to go back to work, you won't be able to do this, that, and I thought, oh my gosh, I heard this before, uh-uh, Cindy Lou didn't do that before, and that, and I always said mind over matter, but when the mind is the matter, you need to look at it a little differently. And so, and the fight is still there, but the fight sometimes I feel like is stronger than that because sometimes when you can't see the disability and that people don't understand why you need that reasonable accommodation and know that you do need that reasonable accommodation. And so I thought to, to be heard. And again, and that's where I started um, a video. I built this team. Like I said, I have a small team that helps me along the West Coast to East Coast, but I started a video seen through the eyes of someone with a brain injury. So I thought we need to educate that word again. We need to educate these people, these doctors who don't understand that we have a life. That I have a life. I, and that, and I built, this is where I built the National Depression Management Center. But you know what? It'd be, like I said, nothing about us without us. So I made this nonprofit. And so, and I made and I wrote with this team a bill on concussion type brain injury. This clearinghouse to put everything in this clearinghouse is HR 3083. That's the number. But again, Bacon, Concord Bacon, and Concord County are my co chairs up in DC. And it's all about you. It's all about me. It's all about what our needs are, what our resources should be, what our funding should be. It's all those gaps, all those gaps I went over and how to make that happen and how to support that and to have our voices heard. And so to, to finish up, this is kind of where I'm at now, is working as an advocate, working with my team, working with the, the, the BIA, the Alliance, working with all you all, working with the team. And, and I'm leaving you with this because I hope I don't get three eyes, but um, 2019, my mom, um, she had dementia. And I always went to visit her, and she always said, Cindy Lou, what are you doing today? When are you going back on the hill? How, how are we doing? You know that. And again, you see Alzheimer's, you see dementia, you see a lot of things. I'm fighting for geriatrics as well. And that because there are a lot of people that said, I mean, our, our, it's funny how our shifts kind of change. She was my right, left advocate for me to not be institutionalized and to have a life. I ended up being her advocate. Because when we went to the doctor, she was having all these falls. 
And he said, well, she has dementia. She's going to die. She's old. You know, what What else? I said, what else is she has till she takes her last breath? She will. Be, she is someone, and you will talk for her and support her. And I say that, my colleagues, because as a child that takes her first and as an elder that takes her last, and all of us between, we, until we take that last breath, we are someone. And so on that note, I held her hand and she couldn't say anything anymore. And on May 2019, on my birthday weekend, but you know, she, um, I was, I had her back. The last few years when she couldn't speak dementia. And I held her hand and I told her, Mom, I got your back and I got others back. And we're going to make some things happen because you allowed me to make it happen. And you were my support. And I got everybody's back on the support. And so, and on that, she squeezed my hand and had tears in her eyes. I knew she had heard me. I said, thank you. Thank you for loving me and supporting me because I'm going to do that for a lot of others. And so, and she passed. And so these slides and this reminder page I take with me when I go on a hill, when I go wherever. And I want you out of any of my slides I do today or in my talk, I want you all, especially my colleagues, my brain injuries, I want you to feel this and get this. Know that you do not let a disability define who you are. You do not let anyone or anything define who you are. You do not let anyone tell you that you do not matter, that you do not matter or belong. Most important, you. You define who you are and what type of advocate you can be. You belong here. You don't ever, ever forget that. That you are a citizen. Your voice matters. And don't let anyone let you know. Your voice matters. Your advocacy matters. You matter. And I see you. I get you. And most of all, I got your back. And like everyone here is. So on that note, I think... I'm finished for with you and I don't even know what time it is. Oh gosh, I only did this in like what is that 30 minutes? So I did this short. So time for QA's. If you have questions or anything like that, but I do thank you for that. But I just want you to know enjoy your life is life is for the fullest. Why not? And so on that note, boy, I did very short time. Usually for me, I can speak pretty much longer. But ask the way if you all have questions. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Cindy. And um, we do have some questions. If you guys have them, please write them in the Q&A and I will ask um, Cindy and get answers for you. So um, the first question um, is, um, someone said, weren't they going to remove the word traumatic so it would encompass all types of brain injury? Would they or are they? I, I think they're asking, uh, they thought it was going to happen and it hasn't quite happened yet. That's, it's still traumatic brain injury as of, of yet now, but again, we're in a new place, we're in a new administration, but advocacy is all the key word. Um, I have not heard, to be honest, I have not heard that they were going to change it yet, but that's not saying they will not. So far, it's still traumatic brain injury. And the cell the administrations and as as I've heard yet it has it will not, has not changed. That doesn't mean it will not because things can happen within a day or within an hour. So um, I like I said, just stay tuned. But as of today, it's dramatic brain. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, um, I am hopeful to learn how Medicare will support individuals. I believe they're referring to it being the chronic condition and what changes that might entail if you were on Medicare. Right, so on that, again, changes are gonna happen, uh, June, uh, excuse me, January of 2025. 
And again, it is more on conditions, but because again, how the BIA advocated for that and supported the standards of Medicare and Medicaid is changing. The um, the terminology is changing where they see traumatic brain injury, changing it as under a chronic condition. So, but also please know that CMS is getting a new administration as well. When I talk, when I go on the hill and talk to representatives and talk about changes, they tell me right now, we're gonna be in the midst of, the administration is changing. So this is just, they tell me to stay tuned. And I know that I'm not trying to pass it off. I'm just telling you what on the hill they're saying and that what CMS is saying as well is that there are gonna be new people coming in and, and there's gonna be new things shifting and changing as it is. And they tell me all the time, Cindy, we, right now, we're just waiting for the new administration and then when January kicks in, we're gonna kick, go forward. So on that note, that's why I mentioned the voice, advocacy and everything is important because if there's some question or something of change or happening, it will happen or will change or get in, or get in and ask them about it. But right now, everything, I'm telling no one is changing anything as of now. And I had got that from about two days ago when I was talking and having my meetings on the Hill about different bills different things happening, which they're saying right now, the administration is not, they're staying kind of on a still tone. No one is saying anything, no one is doing anything because they know the baton is getting ready to change. And that means the new administration is going to do whatever they're going to do. And that's why we need to be ready to advocate. We need to be ready to have our voices be heard. So I hope that helps and I know I probably, I don't know if I fully, fully truly answer that, but right now the answer could change with, within a month of this. And so that's why I'm wanting to make sure that um, we just have to stay tuned and get ready to advocate because when January kicks in, we're really going to have a voice to take. Okay, thank you. Um, this is just a shout out um, from Claire in um, Virginia. And hold on, I just missed her thing. Hold on. Um, hold on. She's from Virginia. Where did hers go? Um, Libby, that was me. I answered it. I said, hi, Claire. Oh. I'm so glad you joined us. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. It's gone. I was going to read it out loud. <laughs> okay. Right. Another question is, if you have time, can you please share how you got involved with the American with Disabilities Act? Sure. Um. How I got involved with that, again, it goes back to my story. Um, I was with the Forest Service um, in, here in North Carolina, Pisgah National Forest. I was the Special Disability Program Manager. Uh, so I was making the forest accessible. Or at that time, trying to make the forest accessible because the ADA wasn't appointed on that. And so what I did, again, is um, I started to... Knowing because I was in at that time I had higher braces and I was in a wheelchair. And so for me to be able to maneuver around the forest and things, I kept going to our our um forest forest techs on that. And I started to um so you know what we need to do this, we need to make this a little bit wider, we need to do this, we need to make this. And I started to start to make things happen. And this was before the ADA. And so with that, um I started. I started doing that. I thought, well, if I'm doing this and a lot of my other forces aren't doing this, um, let me, I called the White House. And so I said, okay, maybe this is something that they need to do with support other forces because again, it went with funding. And so um, I figured out and, and um, again, invited President Bush Sr. at that time, who was getting ready to go out um, to come and join, but because he was getting ready to go out, President Clinton team came on and saw what I was doing. And um and again this was right when 1990 when the American Disability Act was getting ready to be signed on that. And so and it was signed with Bush Senior anyway. But people were still not clear what the AD was about, was and sure wasn't clear about accessibility and reasonable accommodation. We got so much pushback from people saying we don't have to do that. People with disabilities don't belong. We don't see them so why should we build anything? We're like, if you build, they will come. You know, if you build, they will come. 
I mean, we stood strong on that. And so Penn's group came out to my forest area and um, started seeing it. And we started brainstorming, started walking on. And this was happening in Asheville area. And we, and we went out for dinner. And, and under cocktail napkins, I want to tell you guys, cocktail napkins could be a great place to write to write policies. I don't know how many bills and policies I've written on cocktail napkins, and I don't know what that says about me. But I mean, we wrote a lot of signs, a lot of policies, a lot of things on these little cocktail napkins, and and I still have a few of those cocktail napkins because I saved them to just say this is what we stood for. And so with that, um, they appointed me, and Clint came back and they appointed me to be on the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities. Now, the President, at that time, there was about 200 of us. We all had disabilities. Um, we always met. We talked about policy. We talked about accessibility. We wrote the reasonable accommodations, you know, what that looks like, the definitions for all that accessibility. Um, we started to work with um, also the Access Board. Um, and Access Board oversees a lot. And also we worked a lot with DOJ because they had to um, make sure that um, our measurements and everything um, were accurate and correct. And the access board was on that too. We, we again, nothing about us without us. And so all of us, we had all people with disabilities, our service dogs. That was the first time service dogs. I had to put out with service dogs too. Um, we fought for service animals. We had monkeys. We had all different types of service animals. We had little mini horses. We had I had one family, I had one person that had like an, uh, a goat, but you know, and I had a chicken, a chicken named Betty. Oh my gosh. And you think about chicken, but you know, Betty, so she, but to her, she was a guy for this woman that didn't have um, arms. And so she would say, Betty, give me my spoon. Betty, give me my pen. And Betty would reach out in her purse, pick it up and put it in her mouth one to write. I mean, Kudos again to service animals at that. I mean, a wonderful. But we wrote for that because people like dogs aren't allowed this and that. And it used to be what we had to. We had service animals. We had to have a letter from our doctor prescribing this animal, and then we had to show what that animal did to even be able to get into a place. And then even when we went into restaurants and things, um, people were like went sat with us or sat near us because, ooh, how could you have a dog? In this restaurant with this filthy animal, blah blah, and wait till Betsy went into a restaurant. Well, let me tell you, I sat down and Betty, I mean, Betsy went down and she said, Right, and again, she'll sit in the woman's lap. And um, she needed sister help because she had her wands in her mouth and her stick. And um, and it's remarkable what animals or service animals can do, but and I don't know where I was going with it, but again, um, I got started with the ADA that way. I mean, I was on the presence committee now. President's Committee, it's under Department of Labor, Office of, um, we call it OJEP, Office of Disability Employment Policy. Um, the President's Committee is no really no longer really, um, we've got all 200 of us are doing our own thing. Some of us have passed, I work closely with Justin Dart. Justin Dart, oh my gosh. Um, if you Google anything about the ADA, you see a table and you see Justin Dart sitting up there he, I had some great mentors, and I was very blessed. Even um, with not having a voice and telling me I wasn't anything, I went to a table of 200 people that said I was someone. And to say with Justin Dart, he was like, he um, he was an advocate of grace. And when I say grace, he advocated he was a quiet man, um, but he listened. And what he said, might say a few words, but in meant something and i and i watched him he was set and he was just going and the pe representatives sat down the sign and said justin what do you need from us who power of a voice power of a voice and like i said to set by justin Dollar, john camp um tony quello um also tony um young um and also um paul michard all these leaders and people that and Judy Human, and just, just, just so much wealth of knowledge, and so many things we did that when I walk around, um, and and even now, even walking, even though I have no feelings in the waist down, and I wear a brace, um, and then even watching with my vertigo. Just when I go to D.C. or just even walking down, I live in Lexington, North Carolina, 
and just even the small town, and I just stop at a light and see the light flash. And I and also seeing someone in a wheelchair or someone walking or something using the purpose or using something or even large print, you know, on a book or um audio tape, you know, on books and even driving and and audio tapes and just so many devices that a lot of people don't even even kids kids is there, even kids with disability and even kids these days don't even get what we didn't have and what we fought for. I mean, we literally fought for no one, no one accepted us. No one accepted us. And it was just in dark and all of us going with him because once the ADA happened, we had to go in our states. And at that time I was Astra, I was or Forest Service and worked in Astra and, and made areas successful. Does not and you had to work for the city, you had to work for the county, you had to work for everybody to change that and push back, push back, push back. But we had the law, we had Americans with Disability Act. And we said, well, you know, and, and um with that, we did we said this is what you need to and we measured, we had a measuring stick to that we measured stuff and we gave it to them and said this is what you need to do. And the thing is they got a stipend from the government. They got a stipend so it's not like especially mom and pop shops that didn't have the funding. I mean, these big wigs, they had the funding. So we weren't doing, no, we weren't pushing in. But mom and pop shops, we had funding for them to not, because again, under the ADA, to provide a reasonable accommodation, undue, making sure there was not an undue hardship to a person. Um, so that's, we provided funding and we gave them the thing. We said, we'll be back in 30 days. We came back in 30 days with the DOJ. We had DOJ with us, and DOJ, if you weren't there in 30 days, you would get fined with it because we had the voice of the president. We were, because we were the president's committee, we had the voice of the president, and we were, we made ADA happen. We were the voice of ADA. We had a law, we had the law in our hands. We said, these service animals need to go in, this needs to be far, far enough wheelchairs, this and that. We need to have change the lighting, we need to change the sound, we need to change all things, we need to have a quiet room, we need to have conversations and things, we need to have quiet spaces and room for people to, to breathe. So if it if it gets overwhelmed or stressed, we had quiet areas for people to go to. We had in airports now, back in the day, there was not place for these puppy dogs to pee when they go on the airplanes. So we now a lot of the um airports, not all sometimes you have to still ask Sometimes you still not have to ask, but we made sure, I mean, we we made areas and we laid straw down. We made the, um, and again, service animals are not, are taught not to pee or poo on cement or, um, so I want to know, on besides grass, grass, something like that. And so bless their little hearts. A lot of these animals, um, being good, being good trained, um, would not go in places. So we made areas of the outside with turf, you know, because it grass or hay or something. And we put something underneath it so we can roll it up and throw it out and then get it out for the service animal to be able to relieve themselves. Because um, when we did our work, we went into buildings and buildings weren't ready for us. I mean, and we didn't, and that's one thing being an advocate. And Justin Dart, you know, and mentioned, he said, if it's not a cycle, if we, if none of us can go in, none of us will go in. And so we went in, did that. If they didn't, if they pushed us back, whatever, or said we didn't belong, we didn't shop. We didn't restaurant, whatever it was at. We'd go down and sit down, or we'd go up and we'll say, you know what? Nice facility, but you're not accessible. If if, if our guys that were with us can't can get in, I had braces up my waist, you can walk well. If none of us can go in, we're not going. And that started people started thinking. You're missing a big clientele of people that that will not go into facilities. And the federal government under the Rehab Act, they had to be accessible anyway, but because of the ADA, it made the federal agencies knock it up a notch and, and the rehab. They had to really look at their facilities. They had to look about their policies of, of employing someone with a disability because again, reasonable accommodations. If a person is qualified, and but they need a reasonable accommodation under Title I of ADA, you have to provide that reasonable accommodation with that. Um, if the person is qualified, and that's a key thing, we're not asking them just 
put in anybody, if they can do that job description um, with or without accommodation, then that person needs to be seen and looked at as an equal employee um, to be looked at as an employee on that. And we had to fight and we had EEOC on that too, Equal Employment um, Commission. And, that, and, we had and that. I'm going to thank you, Cindy, I'm for sorry, that I'm answer. We have, you're great. I know you get, you know, have a lot to share on that. Okay. So we have three. The ADA. I'm sorry, but that's kind of how I got involved with the ADA. Right. We have three more questions that people oh, would I'm like sorry. answered. So um, one of them is um, about when you do advocacy, do you usually work with an individual or with an organization? Good question, and I had that on, my, on, on one of my notes, and I didn't say it. Both. Both. Um, a lot of times, I'm, I do solo, and and again, when you share your story, make it kind of not like what I just did. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> but but um, but you keep it short and sweet because again, you gotta remember that fifteen minute time limit. Um, but I do it both. A lot of times, I go in. Because a lot of times I go on, on these for my bill, I go by myself a lot. Or if I see something happening here in Lexington or something, I'll go by myself. Or I might call the ARC um, of Northern Virginia. Or I might call the ARC here in Lexington. Or I might call a disability group, a Center of Independent Living or that, or a brain injury organization and just say, hey, uh, what's happening? I know, again, when everybody comes up to in March, the Brain Injury Awareness Month, and I always find my... BIANC, they probably hide from me, but I always find them and, and I hang with them. And so again, because it's it's state, it's North Carolina, you know, we're, we're fine for the same thing. And so so I do it both. You could do it both. Um, Again, we're stronger together than we are apart, but hey, one voice, at least that's a voice. And and that's be heard. So I do it both. You could do it both. Doesn't matter. All right. Awesome. Another question is, in your opinion, what are the most pressing concerns you'd like to see addressed in the upcoming years? And there's oh one God. more question after this. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to see, um, again, I would like, I don't think I have to think this out. So I might not say all of what I'd like to see, um, but I would like to see more support for the brain injury organization groups. Um, because again, I feel I feel like funding is a key thing and is a missed factor. And when I hear groups and I see groups and sometimes groups cannot do what, a lot of these nonprofits can do what they wanna do or have the ability to do. And there's so many people that groups serve and there's so many good people in these groups, you know, that I, I, that I wish there's, we need to look at more funding for groups to be able to advocate and to be able to support individuals with with disabilities and with brain injury on that as well. Um, I'd like to see a lot of the administration to really open up and, and see an individual as an individual, really look at Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid, don't get rid of that um, because there's a lot of talk up there, I know it's just talk. Again, we won't know until January kicks in, and then we'll know how we're going to fight. But in the Medicare and Medicaid insurance, these supports need to happen. These organizations need to stay in place to support it. Um, voices need to be heard. I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. I probably will be able then when I shut you all off or turn off. I think, oh gosh, what did I think about that? Um, let me see. I just want equal access. I want people, I want the education. I want I want more of an understanding of what brain injury is. I want more awareness. I'm not saying the BIAs aren't doing this and then that, but I feel like more education, even with our medical doctor, I feel like. I feel like, you know, the organization, especially the ones that do it, get it for our own medical doctors that to really understand I mean, they, they know the medical terms, they know this and that, but again, I feel like you need to hear the soul to, get, to heal the whole person, kind of like what I said earlier, to truly heal the whole person, uh, to make sure not only the symptoms, yeah, that's important, but when you look through the eyes and get to that soul, that soul is going to show you how that person is going to heal. 
and what that how that person's going to accept the information. So I really think besides the symptoms, you really need to to support the whole person, be it from physical, mental, emotional, social, and if you do that, you're taking care of your society, you're taking care of your community, and that uh, we need to be seen as a person. We really need to see being as a person and and take care of us. And and the organizations that do that as well to go on the field to to, to fight for us need to get the funding to allow them to do that as well. Um, they they need to know what brain injury is truly about. But mainly, they need to know what people with brain injury is all about. Oh, okay, great answer. Thank you. All right, one more question: Is any agency picking up where the CDC left off due to funding with conducting studies on brain injury? I think that I'm, I'm thinking because I know, and I just talked to my my chair on on this that he's. I saw this and I put the CDC, and so I went to Congress Bacon's office because that's the chair of my bill, and we and we and they're sending some letters and the thing to CDC. So far, um, they're trying to get the funding back to CDC, but. There are some other organizations, HHS, um, ACL, they have a TBI TARP, and, and that, not, don't quote me on this, but again, we've got a new administration coming in. So who knows what this is going to look like in January? So the things I might be saying now, I mean, my, my hand, my presentation is given. I mean, my presentation is dead on solid. So, and, and what I believe as a person with a brain injury and as, um, perspective and as a fact. But be that said, we're working on guides on a new administration coming in. And what that looks like, who the hell knows? And I'm sorry about that. Um, and so that's why some of these questions on CDC, um, some of these federal ones and things like that, um, I'm kind of not skeptical on it, but I am to know how to answer that because today it's this, it's TBI, you know, it's mag brain injury. The CDC is having trouble funding, but they said they're going to start funding them and get support that they are. I was told that they were the authority of TBI and brain injury, and that they're and they have the authority to to oversee it with that. And so, but I also know that there are a few Congress individuals or a few representatives that weren't happy with what they're seeing, and so they're questioning that. That's today. So I stay, I say stay tuned because um January 1st, 2025 is a new day. I mean, when um President Trump appointed will get in, he has his own new cabinet, he has some players, the states will have new administration, the states will have new things and stuff like that. And it'll be a new day, it'll be a new fight. And that's where this presentation is important to know our voices need to be heard and your advocacy is important. Be it fed, state, local, whatever. But um, as of now, um, things are shifting and changing and then they're gonna change more and, and when January kicks in. I don't know if I answer that and I'm sorry, guys, I really am sorry. Usually I am solid on my questions and my answers and things like that. And But again, in, mo in a month, um, I mean, I, I'm not getting any answers on the Hill. They tell me, Cindy, things are going to change in January, so we can't say anything. It's illegal to say anything. That's what they that's what they tell me. It's illegal for us to say anything because we don't even know if we're going to be here. So that's the key thing is stay tuned, stay strong, stay ready, and ready to advocate because when it comes, our, our village is going to be attacked or whatever, but our village needs to be strong and steady and ready to take the task and ready to advocate and have our voices be heard. And so that's a key thing. Stay tuned, continue to watch, continue to listen to BIA and see because they'll probably do some guidance and you know, um, some issues because they'll be right in the midst of it as well. And, and they'll give us maybe our marching orders and stuff like that. You know, what, what we need to do as a state but as a unit and as a um person with the brain injury acute acquired brain injury tbi percussion what 
the other person with a disability that we have that move forward and and, and move strong on that but again we're stronger together than we are apart and we're the village so when someone is in our village and we're not happy <laughs> then we need to we need to to voice and i say this all the time educate your locals educate who you need to be to avoid her and you matter you matter more than anything you, you matter you matter and your voice matters and so just be ready be alert and and uh, we'll work on this together and we'll make some things happen because um we're went in it together and i see you i get you and i got you guys so um the voices are always up there so and there are good guys too. I don't want to make it sound like there's. I don't want to. Make, I don't want to end up with the negativity that oh gloom and doom and and all that. Um, um, and it won't be easy. I don't want to do that. But I just want to make sure you know there are good people in our representatives. There are good people up there still on the hill. There's still great people that have our backs. That have our backs. In our states, we're still people that have our backs. We just have to remind them we're here. These are the issues. These are the gaps. Support us on it. And that is a key thing. All right. I hope all of you feel as inspired and motivated to um, fight or advocate as Cindy uses um, so often. Um, great presentation. I learned a lot. I, Like I said, I feel really motivated. Um, I want to thank all of our participants for coming. And um, you are going to be getting a survey. Once we get the surveys back, we will be sending you a um, certificate of attendance. So do you have any last words you want to say, um, Cindy? Or I, mean, I want to I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to speak. And thank you all, because I know you, within this hour, you had you could have anything else to do. You have probably a lot of things to do but you took time to sit and listen to me and be a part. And so on that note, I'm very grateful, I'm humbled, and I appreciate you as a colleague and as a person and BIANC. I love you guys. I thank you for what you do, the people with brain injury, and that. And I thank you for letting me have the opportunity to talk and be a part, and thank you for your support. I thank you guys, and um, we'll make some things happen. 2025 is coming in, and we're coming in at strong. So we'll make things happen, guys. Stronger together. All right. Stronger together. Yes. So thank you all for being here and let me speak. Yes, thank you. And I'm when I end this um, webinar, you should see a pop-up window with your um, survey. All right. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.